From the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State University, I'm Chris Beam. I'm Candace Watts-Smith. I'm Donna Spinelli, and welcome to Democracy Works. This week, we are talking with Kevin Munger, who is an assistant professor of political science and social data analytics here at Penn State, and author of the new book, Generation Gap, Why Baby Boomers Still Dominate American Politics and Culture. And You know, as we've said on the show before, Candace, you and I are both millennials and Chris, you and Michael are both boomers. So we really personify on the show a lot of the things that Kevin talks about in his book. And it's, you know, it's easy to laugh about memes like, okay, boomer and, you know, things like this. But I think Kevin's work really shows us that underneath all of that, there are some really, really pressing issues that are worthy of our attention and our consideration. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, obviously there is something, you know, pretty fundamental going on when you have a phenomenon like the boomers, just in terms of their their sheer number and a number alone, right? I mean, they're going to have an impact on society at large. I mean, you know, you, they talk about the pig through the python. At every stage of their lives, they are going to impact and dominate the society at the society as a whole, but now these boomers are, well, let's say it, old, and so they're becoming, they're they're growing into, in terms of the lifestyle that or the life cycle, kind of the uh, pinnacle of their power in terms of politics and especially and especially politics and economics, and that's reflected in our politics. It sets up this kind of conflict that Kevin sees on the horizon and that that has serious implications for our politics right now and in the near and medium term future. So just to be clear, boomers are people who were born, Americans who were born between 1946 and 1964, and millennials, that is a term that we often use to mean young people, but the eldest millennial is 41. So they range from 1981 to 1986 or 1996. And, you know, we tend to talk about millennials in terms of um, like the me generation or snowflakes or super, super entitled, but they are also a group that is one of the most diverse generational Mm -hmm. cohorts. They are part of the biggest part of the working work, like working Americans. They are a large part of the American electorate. And, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, each generation, we, and, and, you know, we can talk about like how real or not real these groups are, but, you know, by trend, on average, members of each of the generations have very different experiences and, you know, come to age in different political moments and different economic moments that shape their lives and outlooks. And so, yeah, while we tend to, as you said, Chris, kind of joke around about, you know, hey, boomers or entitled millennials, that there are, you know, particular sets of political, economic and social interests that are shared across generations. And when we see that one group dominates having a say on the policies and politics, and we have a problem if we're supposed to, you know, be living in a society where people who have an interest at stake should be able to have a say, either in the mass public or as political elites. Right. The other thing that he that Kevin says is is really important is the idea that there's a form of media by which this experience is conveyed, is mediated to these individuals. So for baby boomers, the big thing is the three networks, right? There were ABC, CBS, and NBC, and that was the only TV you could get. It was all over the air. And and these were shared experiences. There wasn't an American who didn't know who Walter Cronkite was. There were, I mean, you know, when we would go to school in the morning, it was just an assumption that everyone had watched Happy Days the night before. And, and so for what he's, Kevin's arguing is that not only do baby boomers have these kind of shared experiences, but they also have this shared media that 
help them define these events and help them define themselves in relationship to those events. And so there's a double whammy in terms of baby boomers power because there's so many of them and they're so cohesive around as a result of this shared media. And he says that's not the case anymore. So I think even in this kind of fractured media situation, the average millennial really tuned to the fact that they were basically required to get higher education and then stepped into a job market where uh, they had no kind of safety net or when they were ready to buy a home, you know, like what happened there or when they're ready to start a family as we move through, you know, through the you know, now you want to start a family, but you have college debt. And so you have all of these things. So, you know, the state of the economy or economic shocks, terrorist attacks, assassinations, political scandals can also make a generation. I think, you know, like my son's generation and Gen Z, so my son's generation is not named yet, but Gen Z, you know, are probably tied together by school shootings or drills or that drills, might right. happen by school shootings or, or COVID. COVID. Right. So, you know, I think that shared media is important, but we'll also keep in mind that generations are shaped by many things and that I'm not really sure that the average baby boomer goes around thinking about themselves as boomers, but as people who experience a very particular social, economic and political milieu that is very different from the one that we have now. I mean, I do think I, I disagree slightly with your characterization of the 60s. I do think that there is, you know, this kind of identity, not as being a baby boomer, but, it, but as being a child of the 60s mm-hmm. and growing up and, and in this, this tumult, right? Not mm-hmm. just of civil rights, but also of women's rights mm-hmm. and of, you know, radical politics and mm-hmm. drugs and sex and all these things mm-hmm. against, you know, against the prevailing mores, that vents media all combine to create this distinctively, uniquely powerful generation in American politics. But in politics, the world is changing and and politics is the means by which we adapt to those changes and and move our society forward in ways that is more productive more more responsive to this world in which we find mm-hmm. ourselves right yeah i think that's that's well put chris and a really a good synopsis of of a lot of what kevin talks about in the book and in this interview so let's get to it here is my conversation with kevin munger Kevin Munger, welcome to Democracy Works. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Jenna. I'm excited to talk to you. So lots to cover uh, in your new book, Generation Gap. But before we get into some of your specific arguments, I I wonder if you could just talk for a little bit about the idea of a generational cohort, how social scientists like yourself think about them versus how people in marketing or the media might think about them and and how you sort of navigated the difference between the two in this book. Yeah, absolutely. So of course, we're all familiar with the idea of a generation and cohort. And I think that for most people, that idea does come from the marketing angle or from some kind of trivial, like, intergenerational sniping in uh, clickbaiting news media about, oh, the boomers are doing this, the millennials are doing that. And I think as a result, people don't take the idea seriously enough. So precisely because it's become so popular in a trivial way, and that kind of overshadows the kind of serious social science at its core. So the idea really gets going with a essay by German sociologist Karl Mannheim called The Problem of Generations. And so he was writing in the 1920s and he was trying to basically figure out what conditions give rise to a a generation that experiences the world the same way, right? So the key thing for Mannheim was not simply the fact that you shared a birthday, it's that you shared a social location so that there were people who were going through the same stages of life at the same time. And as a result, they 
had a lot more in common um, than people who were not. So that essay kicked off uh, a bit of research at that period. And ever since, there have been specific generations that have been identified as the results of some large scale social mobilization or some events that caused a just disproportionately large number of people to have a similar experience of the world. And, and so that gave social scientists a kind of ad hoc perspective on unique generations. When we come around to the 60s and 70s, the more statistically rigorous methods that were being developed at that time came to realize that there was a pretty serious problem with naive generational analysis. So this is called the age period cohort problem, and it's essentially unsolvable. So the problem is that for a, let's say today, 2022, we could look at the voter turnout rate by age, right? And we can observe that older people today tend to vote more often than younger people do. But that doesn't tell us whether or not that's an age-based story or if that's a cohort generational-based story. So it could be the case that the cohort of people who are currently old happen to vote more for some reason. Or it could be that older people in general happen to vote more often. So this is the, and so in a given time period, so if we hold fixed the year 2022, we cannot disentangle these two age and cohort effects. And, and this gets us to the need for over time analysis. So we have a long enough time series, the kind of thing I, I bring to bear in the book, we can start to disentangle the differences between age and cohort on a certain set of issues. And so I think that we're sort of at a place now where 60, 50 years after this problem started to be identified, we've got a long enough time series of data that we can start to rigorously answer some of these age period cohort questions that they couldn't in the 60s and 70s. I want to take a minute to set up this idea of the boomer ballast. It is uh, the, one of your core concepts in the book, and I believe maybe uh, was a, an early title of the book, uh, if I'm thinking about a, a previous draft I saw. But you say that you know unless you're really into sailing or hot air balloons, the concept of a, of a ballast might not be very familiar to you. Uh, so can you set up what that is and, and why it applies? applies to the baby boom generation. Absolutely. So yes, this is the key concept. If this is the only thing you take away, I hope that the definition of the word ballast and the idea of boomer ballast is it. So, right. I started with the premise that the baby boomer generation is historically unique. I mean, we see this as the first generation identified by the U.S. Census. It's like the only generation that is officially designated as such by the census. And it looms large in our current understanding of post-war American history. So simply starting with the fact that there are a lot of baby boomers can explain a lot of the variation, I would say, at a very high level, between the emphasis on youth culture in uh, the 60s and, and 70s and uh, moving on to a kind of mature business, middle-aged culture in, in the 80s and 90s. And now the in some cases, I mean, geratocratic culture we're observing in, in Washington with the oldest president, oldest Congress in history. So the idea of ballast, I think, helps explain the role that boomers have played in American politics and culture. So ballast is something that's designed to keep a vessel steady, right? So a hot air balloon could go sailing into the sky in the absence of ballast. These are the sandbags you see on the side. And of course, if there's too much ballast, the hot air balloon can't get off the ground. So thinking about demographic or, or generational weight, we see that the generational center of gravity for American politics and culture has moved along with this baby boomer generation as they have aged. So this means that in some cases, our culture has been changing less quickly than it otherwise would. And, and presently, as the boomers are kind of at the top of the age distribution, they're still running most of the major institutions, Congress especially. And as a result, I think this is putting some tension on the rest of younger generations 
who would like to change things and like to like reshape the world in their own image as every generation wants to. And they're a bit frustrated that they are unable to do so because of the demographic weight of this boomer bounce. So let's talk more about the media. This is another big component in your book. I mean, the U.S. is a very large country and a whole lot of people in them. And so to the extent that people have a shared experience, it is because of shared media consumption, right? So I think we can start telling this story about the coherence of the boomer generation as such. Yes, through large scale events like the Vietnam War or college protests, this kind of thing, but also through the rise of television as a media technology. So they were the first generation to be raised by television and to spend a large number of their youth and adolescence consuming TV. This constituted a shared cultural background that they could use to construct a, a shared identity. So I think that younger generations are similarly basing their identity on the media they consume. I think, of course, that compared to the days of broadcast television when there are three to five channels, the diversity of media options facing Gen Z and millennials is quite a bit higher. And so there's less coherence on this dimension, at least they're not watching exactly the same thing, but the kinds of things they're watching and the kind of language that the, this media uses is certainly a source of generational identification. So there is currently a very large divide, even this current period between the types of media that the young and the old consume. So cable technology, cable, te te cable television is still I think the most important media technology in American politics is overwhelmingly the domain of the old. So the average viewership for these shows, I mean, you can, if you watch them, you can see based on the advertisements they run, right? So they're, they're selling ads. I watch Jeopardy as well. And the ads are, are for retirement funds and they're for life insurance and they're for, I mean, buying gold. And then there's a lot of political ads as well, right? So this correlates to the general interest in politics being considerably higher among the baby boomers than among younger generations. So in contrast, millennials, Gen Z, in their consuming political media, much more likely to say that social media is the main place that they get political news information from. And that could mean a whole lot of different things, right? For example, the types of issues that really appeal to the young and the old and that are covered in the media they consume can be really quite distinct. Right. And so, you know, among millennials and Gen Z, you were just talking about this, there, there's this big divide and just in terms of the sheer number of media, media personalities, media outlets that, that are available to be consumed. There's any number of, you know, YouTube channels and individual influencers and Substack newsletters and podcasts and, you know, all the, all the rest of it. Uh, and I, I wonder to what extent this diversity of, of available options is, is preventing these generations from forming that more cohesive identity that you articulated among the boomers and to what extent you see that as problematic moving forward. I do think that the, let's say, just general experience of a Twitter feed or an Instagram feed is a kind of similarity, even if the content is not the same. The basic framework through which younger generations experience the world on these platforms is a shared location, at least. So that is, is something I, I would say I, this is very much unsettled, right? So generational identification tends to get stronger as as people get older, all, all kinds of identification do. So but I would say it's an open question. But I think that the younger generations are more diverse on a lot of dimensions. So it makes it somewhat difficult to tease out what is causing the relative fragmentation. Hmm. So clearly, the younger generations are much more racially diverse than are the baby boomers. If anything, the baby boomers are the whitest generation in history. So this is specifically because of patterns in US immigration policy. So during the early parts of the 20th century in the just like a romanticized period of Ellis Island and immigration, 
on the West Coast, right? There's a lot of immigrants who are coming to this country during that time period. And so the percentage of foreign born is very high. But then they change uh, the immigration policy largely because of uh, xenophobia, World War II, and it remains very low, such that when the boomers are being born, that's kind of the low point of immigration to the United States in the 20th century. And then there is the process by which certain ethnic groups become deracialized. So that is the concept of the category of whiteness expands, right? So during the early 20th century, groups like Irish, Italian, Jewish immigrants were racialized. That is, they were considered an other group who were not part of the mainstream white American society. And then throughout the 20th century, they, they became deracialized and they became white. And I guess that's a theme I have come back to the book to a lot, is that mid-century America, post-war America, and the baby boomers are, for my generation and sort of everyone alive today, our conception of what normal is, right? And this mm -hmm. is actually a consequence of the demographic weight of the baby boomers. Like, their experience, because there's so many of them and they're so powerful, has come to be seen as the default experience mm -hmm. for Americans. As you said, we have this gerontocracy in some ways with, you know, all all three branches of government that the, the sort of leadership is very old in in their their 70s or who are older in some cases, but you know, you also look at when this this of course, you know, prevents younger people from running for office in in some ways, but you know, you do look at people like AOC and, and Madison Cawthorn, who have kind of bucked this trend. Uh, and you you think about they have they have a strong social media presence and really made a name running on the extreme ends of their parties. Do you is is this what people from the millennial and Gen Z generations need to to do to to be successful and to you know get break through this this boomer ballast or do you do you expect that we might see more of these types of candidates moving forward? So this is a big point of tension, right? So the similar to the housing situation, I, so I think it's helpful to characterize certain institutions which are more or less zero sum, right? So housing, it's not really zero sum. But it's not that elastic, and we haven't really started to build as many houses as we need. And so there really is a situation where if when a, a baby boomer who's been living in this house for 40 years leaves, it is just one other millennial or, or other younger generation who gets to have that house. Uh, and that's the case for house seats as well. So seats in the house are entirely inelastic. There is a specific fixed number of them. And so the fact that there have been such a large cohort of people who have been serving together for so long and the incumbency advantages means that there are just uh, numerically going to be fewer millennials who get to serve in Congress. And I think this problem is exacerbated <clears throat> by our two-party system, the two-party mm -hmm. system being downstream of our electoral institutions. And I think we can see this through comparisons to other democracies. So. Most democracies have different electoral institutions than we do, like the key ones being a uh, non-single member win district uh, and non-winner-take-all voting. So you have a parliamentary system such that if you get 20% of the vote in the country, you get more or less 20% of the seats in the Congress, the legislature. So this means that in Europe and, and parts of Latin America, we're seeing explicit youth-focused parties so parties where they really care about environmental issues, but then other issues that are related to uh, millennials in those countries are also reflected. And maybe even more importantly for this aspect of the story, they, they are able to begin to develop a uh, cohort of politicians and political activists. And then once you get a few seats in parliament, then you're able to have a platform to broadcast your message. And this is a kind of virtuous cycle where um, you get a, a toehold and then you can start to attract more members and develop uh, a larger base of activists and donors and a higher quality candidate pool. And so in contrast, in the US, we only have a two parties. And so for millennials to make inroads to Congress, they either have to work entirely within the system and, and play by the rules of the 
party establishment, which in many cases can take a very long time to work themselves into a position where they can replace a baby boomer who, who wants to leave, or they can adopt these outsidery strategies that we see from people like AOC and Madison Cawthorn. And I think the thing that the, those two have in common are the, the use of social media in a way that is relatable to millennial voters. But at the same time, I, I think you also say that, you know, these, uh, we have to, we have to learn how to use our communications technologies, all the, all the, you know, social media and all the, all the things we have rather than be used by it. That, that reminds me of something that I, I say to my students a lot of, you know, if, if you're not paying for something, then you are the product, right? I think that there's, there's a lot of that going on. And so how does that challenge play into this, this idea of really trying to build and, you know, work from the local level up, you know, build these, these coalitions from the bottom up? Yeah. So I think that social media can be pernicious in that it offers some illusions of influence and particularly of power, right? So there are a number of theorists who are coalescing around this idea that social media is kind of a, a steam valve by which people can feel as if they are acting in the world. But in fact, this might be distracting from the way in which power is actually wielded, which is developing durable, large-scale organizations, communities, groups that can act at, you know, at scale and over a long time and can plan and can execute strategic actions. So social media certainly allows people to stir up energy, attention, get people into the streets even. But we see through many of these social media revolutions that have taken place around the world and social media protests that once people get to the street, that's the only tactic they have. And so this means that, for example, a well-organized state, and all of the major states are well-organized, can simply wait them out, right? They deploy their defense forces, they, you know, in, engage in these police actions, and then, you know, a month passes, two months passes. And it's simply not possible for a social media-driven movement to sustain energy for that long, and neither is it really possible for them to even make medium-term strategic advances, right? So without um, a leader, for example, these, these are often described as leaderless movements and as if this was a good thing, but without a leader, without a structure to think about strategy and then actually bargain with the people in power, you're not able to come up with some kind of compromise. In fact, the only thing that happens is uh, after a while, people go home and people get arrested and then maybe some things you know, get torn down or something like this, but the fundamental structures are not actually worried by this, right? And so people were excited about the Arab Spring or whatever, like the early period of the social media movements, and it was effective for overthrowing some extremely outdated, obsolete regimes, but a modern sort of center of power is well organized and they're easy, easily able to you know, control and manage these kind of social media driven movements. So, you know, the other thing that that I'm thinking about here is that there's uh, also maybe this kind of not not scolding, maybe, but just the, this attitude among boomers that, you know, millennials, Gen Z, you guys just need to, like, figure it out. It's, it's not our fault that, you know, things haven't really gone this way. Like, you just you need to, you know, get off of, of social media and, and just, you know, figure it out, make things happen for yourselves, just like they would perhaps argue that that they did for themselves. So I, I guess I wonder what, what you might say to that. That's a kind of response already. I've, I've certainly experienced it on Twitter um, from self-identified boomers. And it's certainly the case, right? That boomers are not the majority of voters in the country, right? The younger generations clearly outnumber them. That's, that's clearly right. Somewhat odd perspective, I suppose, that the baby boomers control the House and Senate to an unprecedented degree. They've held the United States presidency for 28 consecutive years, and the, they only lost it in 2020 to someone who is technically too old to be a boomer. So we clearly see in the demography of our elected officials stark inequalities. And so the fact is that uh, younger generations vote at a lower rate 
than older generations do. And this age period cohort allows us to differentiate the relative impact of generation and age. And it's, it's the case that there is a generational impact. Each generation votes at lower rates than the previous one, but age dominates that effect uh, to a very noticeable degree. And so the simple fact that there are a lot of old people now means that they are the ones who control American politics. And this problem becomes radically more severe when we look at campaign finance, right? And so you want to talk about inequality. Inequality among the top 500 donors is uh, ridiculous. In fact, I looked at the, I believe it was 40 donors, and the, of the top 40 donors to political campaign or campaign spending in general, the median age is over 80, mm. right? And so insofar as we think that there's too much money in American politics, that is being spent by the extremely old, right? And so if that is actually a problem, which many people think it is, the fact that the, the people who are calling the shots, you know, are actually really very far from, from young people on a lot of issues makes it a big problem for uh, younger people who are trying to change things. Well, Kevin, we've covered a lot of ground here, and I hope that folks will pick up your book, Generation Gap, to dive deeper into to some of these insights and some of these arguments. But as, as a last question here, what do you hope boomers take from your book? And, and what do you hope that millennials or, or members of, of Gen Z take from the book? Sure. I mean, I think that the big thing for boomers is realizing how much the world has changed. And so on this point, I'm actually quite sympathetic. I think that in general, let's say American culture and American, like the economy doesn't really value older people, right? So the, the ideology of progress that we share doesn't have a lot of use for people who cannot contribute economically. And so the fact is that we have this large cohort of people who a lot of people resent now and who are somewhat alienated from contemporary culture and society, but didn't necessarily do anything wrong themselves. They just played by the rules, did what they thought was right. And now they're in this position where they're sort of under attack. And so I, I think that's not a good place to be, but I think that the kind of a, a point where some compromise might be reached is just realizing how much the world has changed. And I think just looking at the demographics is a stark story, right? And so there is a bit of whiplash going on, but we have to move past this idea of the boomer experience as being the default or normal on basically every dimension and come to appreciate that the world really has changed. And that was like, in some ways, a kind of golden age of shared prosperity and growth, at least for white Americans, one that is, uh, likely never to return and is also somewhat unprecedented in a comparative analysis of the world. So I think that wider perspective should help baby boomers come to appreciate their place in society today. And for the younger generation, I, you know, I think there's something to be said for the idea of getting off social media, right? So this, this does seem to be a um, significant problem for the growth of like genuine democratic power in the country and also just sort of a, a sort of new thing that's come along and is uh, we don't really know what it does yet so i think that the the faith in this entertainment technology that is optimized for selling ads to produce good democratic outcomes is a bit silly but that doesn't mean it can't be useful it's just that the main way that democratic power operates is still the same as it was organizing political parties and actually uh, taking power well, we will leave it there. Kevin Munger, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been, it's been a great conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jenna, for that great interview with Kevin. One of the things that stuck out to me is that, you know, the United States is basically a gerontocracy. It's, you know, quite elderly average age in Congress and yeah oldest know, in history that's what Kevin says in yeah. history amidst the most kind of most important revolution in a lot of things right like in communication and the problems that we're trying to solve that we're facing you know when the first boomers were born the average life expectancy was about 63 years old today boomers can expect to live to about 
79. Mm-hmm. Joe Biden is 79. And that's even that's when when they're born. By the time they get to be 65, if they get to be 65, their life their um longevity just, is is decades, yeah. Yes. Nancy Pelosi's 82, Mitch McConnell mm-hmm. 80, Chuck Schumer 71. Kamala Harris is the youngest at 57. She's born in the last year of the boomers. Mm-hmm. But you know, I think one of the kind of ironies about this whole thing is that you know, people were trying to get RBG to retire so that Obama could p- replace her with someone who was younger. And of course, like the request was about like ideological consistency on the Supreme Court. But underlying the assumption is that like it's important for older people to move away so that they can be so that those positions can be replaced with younger folks, new ideas. And even if it's ideological, where share idea, ideological stripes, mm-hmm. but like maybe there are new ideas under the, those umbrellas, but we're not seeing that in our, you know, nation's legislature and you know, this is becoming increasingly problematic, best illustrated by the tensions, the debates around climate change, around college debt, around social security, around gun violence. And the longer we delay on these issues, not only do we have the issue, like the, the fact of the problem getting worse, you know, especially with regards to climate change and housing shortages and things like that. But you also have growing resentment among the people who know they're going to have these effects, having these effects and going to live through these effects and yet don't have a say about it. So so you can you can just see or you can predict that when this if it doesn't move, if, if people don't move off the stage gracefully, then it's going to be likely that when they do move off the stage ungracefully, there, there's going to be a reaction. So, you know, there's all, there's this tons of research that shows that older people tend to vote more than younger people. Right. And there are a number of reasons for that. But one of the reasons is because voting is made difficult for people who are highly transitory, mm-hmm. right? Or, you know, we think about the power of incumbency, you know, just name recognition and having been there gives you a lot of staying power. I mean, Mm -hmm. we can see the incumbency rate is, you know, in the 90% or something like that. So we also have a situation where, as you mentioned before, there's been a particular confluence of circumstances that allowed baby boomers to gain, you know, both political power, but also economic power and cultural power, cultural power, Mm -hmm. But they, but, you know, power breeds power. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, they are, have also like worked to set up institutions that make it difficult for power to be, you know, contested. The other thing that I, that I want to say about this whole issue of, of, of electoral politics is, you know, he mentions that because we are a winner take all system. That's another reason why a, a dominant generation is so, it's so easy for them to stay mm-hmm. in power and it's so hard for uh, a competing generation mm-hmm. to, com- to, you know, to actually win seats and again, to develop these skills, networks, visibility that enables it to compete. And, you know, he says in the rest of the the first world, the rest of the democracies in the world, this isn't this isn't happening. There are green parties that are that are run or at least, you know, prevailingly associated with young people, not boomers. But because we don't have we only have two parties, there's only you know, there's only so much you can do to develop these skills and develop these this standing politically. And the point that he brings up about, you know, if we have proportional representation, for example, then we would have room for more people to voice a array of different, you know, you know, means to get into politics. I think that's I think that's absolutely right. And I think that we can see in many ways how our yeah, how the how the rules at hand diminish opportunities for more people to have a say 
at the kind of highest levels of politics. You know, I think that if, you know, all the energy that was put around Bernie Sanders among young people, for example, if that same energy was put around uh, local politics and, and school boards and other kind of entry points for, for political power, I just think that's, you know, irrespective of how difficult or unfair that challenge is, I don't know what other alternative there is. So we don't disagree. And actually, I think if we look at local politics, we see that young people are Mm -hmm. game. I mean, I sometimes have my students look at the youngest mayors elected. They are young people. I mean, there are many mayors under 30, you know, under 35. So I, I don't disagree with you that it's important for people to galvanize politically. I think what it is important for us is to pinpoint the fact that there are barriers that could be lifted by people making, (laughs) you know, different decisions. And those people are people who do not want to uh, give up the power that they have. Right. Right. Given that the way the institutions are shaped, it, it would require them to retire and, you know, at a, at at a regular retirement age. Or, you know, I mean, there ought ought to be a point where, I mean, what is Charles Grassley going to be? I mean, he's 88 or something and he's running for reelection. I mean, you know, the, the only thing I could see changing the dynamics here is if something, if the, in appropriateness of that becomes apparent to all. And so then you see a kind of a cultural backlash against the idea of putting an octogenarian in such a position of power. I am not trying to be ageist here. I think it's important for us to keep in mind that a representative democracy has to be representative on many dimensions. And one of the ones that we don't have right now is on the dimension of generations. Mm-hmm. So, and and I think if you want to be a little ahead of the curve in terms of where our politics, where our society is going, this book really helps you do that. So thanks, uh, Jenna, for a, uh, a really good interview and Kevin Munger for, for coming and telling us about all these things. So, so I'm Chris Beam. And I'm Candace Watts-Smith with Democracy Works. Thanks for listening. Democracy Works is a collaboration between the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU, Central Pennsylvania's NPR station. Our editors are Mickey Klein, Chris Kugler, and Mark Stitzer. Editorial review by Emily Reddy. And additional production support from Andy Grant and Chris Allen. If you enjoyed what you heard today, leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. It will help new people find the show. Find more great podcasts about democracy and civic engagement in the Democracy Group Podcast Network at democracygroup.org. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.